Thank you very much, um, Theodora, Liz, Lavina, Chikizu, Mary and Retta, Lilian, Erspiar, Godson. Oh, yes, Dr. Chikizu, you're so wrong. So while preparing for this you know, discussion, I asked ChatGPT to do me an intro um, to you know, AI and what its impact would be to freedom of expression in Africa. And, you know, this is courtesy AI, my intro courtesy AI. AI is having a significant impact on freedom of expression in Africa, both positive and negative. On the one hand, AI can be used to enable free expression and increase access to information. For example, we have AI-powered search engines, news aggregation platforms, and social media tools, which can help African citizens access a wider range of viewpoints and news sources, express their opinions, and share their stories with the world. And on the other hand, AI can also be used to express free expression and restrict access to information. And so other actors can use AI-powered surveillance and censorship tools to monitor and control online discourse link access to certain websites or social media platforms, and even identify and target individuals who express dissenting views. So how do we begin? Today, I would want us to look at AI as AI, um, its impact on information, and its impact on freedom of information and freedom of expression. And I also want us to you know, touch on the impact it will have on jobs, on ethics, and on misinformation, right? And the first question would be, how do we all, what do we think about AI and the rave about AI? And this is a general question. Everyone can actually key in here um, from, I think we'll start with Dr. Chikizie, Lavina, um, Godzin, and then Liz. Um, this is just before I do, you know, a proper intro of the persons who I'm speaking to. I want, before we hear, um, before we know the about of you, um, let's hear what you think about AI generally. So Dr. Chikezi, let's start with you. Hi, Tony. Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to, I would like by, first of all, start, uh, to start to say thank you for having me and hello to my fellow panelists. Uh, this topic uh, that we're discussing today is, of course, is at the front burner of um, conversations happening around um, the world right now. And when we're talking about AI, AI is such a big thing um, that we cannot even begin to define it in terms of what, what it really is, um, because it's a lot of things. But generally, um, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about the use of machines that are based on, um, you know, that that have the capability to imitate or even exceed uh, human cognitive capabilities, and you know, be it about sensing, language interaction, reasoning, analytics, problem solving, and even creativity. So it's just those sort of the use of machine learning and large data sets that to, to generate patterns and predictions that have uh, that are human-like um, or that can mimic human intelligence and, and behavior. Um, and so the conversation about how it affects uh, freedom of expression, it's, um, it's still an emerging area when you talk about uh, the role of AI or the impact of AI in um, freedom of expression. I think the the more saturated conversations have been on the role of AI in you know the wider society, but especially for journalism, where we know that for journalism it can help journalists uh, do more effective data journalism or uh, using big data and stuff like that. But um, yeah, um, sorry, I think I missed. I think you asked two questions at once. So um, I don't know if you wanted me to just define AI or if, if there's a second follow-up question. No, you. so I just wanted to get what your thoughts are generally on AI because I know I mean, lots of people think a lot of things about AI, yeah? So let's yeah. have Lavina speak next and then Godzin and Liz. Hi, yeah. Lavina. Uh, hi everyone, thanks so much for uh, the previous panelists and uh, thank you to uh, to you for having me. 
Um, so yeah, quite an interesting question. Where are we in the race of it? I would say very, very at the early beginning stages of it. Um, as much as a lot of development is actually happening within the space, um, and you know things are changing almost every day at this point in time, mm-hmm. that we're getting new innovations and we're getting a newer sort of uh, you know uh, push in terms of where the tech can actually go. Um, I still believe from a corporate perspective, we at early stages. Everyone obviously wants to place themselves in that category of putting themselves as the leaders in that space. Uh, so obviously, we've had the likes of Google, Microsoft, um, you know, OpenAI and the likes kind of compete with each other. We've seen them uh, asking for a pause in terms of where AI innovation is going, um, you know, and then equally so on the regulatory side. There's a lot of different approaches that's being taken from a regulatory perspective. And, you know, again, you know, everyone's trying different nuances. And I think the reason why we have such varied approaches in this race at this moment in time is purely because no one understands the full potential of what this could be. Um, You know, and that's the sort of uh, question mark that really needs answering, together with the fact that we, for the first time, are creating another intelligent being on the planet that will share the space with us. And that comes with its own ethical fears and conundrums, uh, but I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> um, okay, Gotsin, um, your turn. I, I, like, I like the fact that um, my co-panelists have said positive things about AI. But I think, <laughs> well, first, first is, I, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I thank my co-panelists. I'll give you a, a, a little example. This morning, I was working on an opinion for a client and asked it to need to prepare a first draft for me. I opened the draft, I looked at it, and I couldn't find any of the laws in the draft. So I was wondering where the training got the answer, because the answers were just straight to the point. I was wondering, how did you get this? I called, I said, please, please, come, come. Where did you get this? I said, he reviewed the laws, he went through everything, and I like, this can't, that's not possible. Because I can't see any analysis of the law yet, I can only see the conclusion yet. And, I that point, I said, do you use chat GPT? I was like, yes, like, come on. <laughs> so why I trust so much in, in, in AI, we also know that it has its shortcomings. We also know that it's still at developmental stage, as Lavina said. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And um, yes, it's, the, it's like a human being, and you know, you're trying to program a human being. You want a technology to do things that ordinarily would have been done by humans. So there's a lot of things, a lot of effort you have to put to that. So it's that is at that baby um, baby stage, and I think we, we can still get there if we continue to work on it. So that's just it. Mm, thank you very much. And now to Liz, um, Liz Oyange. Thanks, Anthony. Um, yeah, so for this one, I am kind of on the fence. So um, as long as AI, AI really is just based on data. So it depends and reacts on the kind of data you feed it. So as long as that data is being used to benefit the society, then of course we should embrace it. However, we should also consider that AI can be used in a way that impacts the society negatively. So if you think about AI that has been fed on negative data, perhaps to profile people based on their race, uh, based on their language, um, perhaps they're uh, they're being trained um, on how to be bullies or abusive on social media, then that's negative. So as long as that data is positive and it's impacting society positively, then I think we can always um, welcome um, um, the uh, Okay, thank you very much, um, Lise Yange. Um, Liz manages the corporate office at Aga Khan University Global East Africa, and she's a corporate specialist. Um, she was also elected the first Creative Commons Kenya chapter lead in 2018, and she has uh, been involved with the network in various capacities since 2013. Um, so her passion is IP and its intersections with traditional knowledge and culture and technology. And we also have Godzin, who was also a corporate lawyer at Udo Doman Filosage with experience in intellectual property, technology, and entertainment. And also we have um, Lavina. Lavina is here. Lavina is, uh, okay, fondly and popularly known as AI Mom. 
here on the continent of Africa, conscious tech proponent with expertise in strategy, tech and psychology, you know, and how they integrated AI, blockchain and ethics. And she's in future, featured on, you know, top 10 women advancing AI 2023, venture with finalists for women in AI responsible and ethics and, you know, a lot more that this, you know, goes on. And then we also have um, Dr. Chikis Yeyu Zewuna, a lecturer and ex school committee member in the School of Journalism and Media Studies at Rhodes University in South Africa. He has a PhD in Media Studies from the University of Cape Town and was a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute for Humanities in Africa, funded by Carnegie Corporation of New York. Um, he's also published um, over 25 academic outputs and is a fellow of the Nigerian School of Internet Governance. Now, I we're also expecting Stephanie O. Adams Douglas, a media and development practitioner with the Center for Journalism Innovation and Development, but then we have to move on. Now, one thing that is really important, um, just a few weeks or months ago, we saw the picture of Donald Trump, you know, being dragged to prison in quotes, right? Yeah, and Tony, that's Stephanie using the iPhone. Hi. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Welcome to, um, welcome Stephanie. Um, so this picture is, you know, according to what we heard, it's doctored by AI. And this brought a lot of, you know, discussion. A lot of people were saying, oh, how can we trust, you know, what's the news we see? How can we trust the information we see online? Um, Dr. Chikeze, how much impact, you know, do you think AI would have on information generally? as it's being produced, as it's being distributed. Mm. Uh, thanks, Tony. I think this, this question has a, it's, I mean, this question is double barrier because we're talking about impact, but we can by the fact it's helping, uh, you know, not just journalists, but also researchers and other AI power tools. Like when you are using referencing systems like, um, uh, Mendeley or EndNote or uh, what's this one that I'm using? Uh, you know, yeah. When you're using such 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 referencing tools, you are also using AI powered tools. When you are using Quillbot, that helps you for your writing. You know, so as a sort of writing assistant, that's AI. When you're doing data analysis and you want to use some sort of application to run the data, that's AI. When you are needing help with transcription and doing your interviews and transcribing it, you know, in a, in a more effective or easy way, that's AI. Um, and so on and so, so forth. And of course, with generative AI now, chat GPT and um and other ones, uh, the, the one from Microsoft, Bing, the one from Google, uh, I've forgotten the name now, is it, is it Badu or something? So all of these are AI powered tools, which are really helpful in the work that we do, whether as journalists or communicators or researchers, um, all of these are fine, but there is the other side. The downside is that, of course, AI is not infallible. AI can give wrong information, and it can also reference sources that do not exist. So I think increasingly we should be mindful of the fact that AI is not the be all and end all because you know this, all of these sort of technological uh, solutionism that we embrace when we talk about new innovation or new technological innovation, new technologies come out and we all run to embrace it as, as if it's, you know, it, it's going to change the world. But AI is, can still be wrong. AI can give wrong information. AI is not the expert on all issues and all subjects. And I really like um, what one of the, I was reading an article a few days ago and someone said that AI is not original because it's not breaking anything new it, because it's based on existing data, existing information of what is already out there. And so it doesn't have that analytic capability or the, or the agency to, you know, to give you something new. When you, for example, I I, I think either you, Tony, or, um, or Godwin was talking about putting something on chat GPT and, you know, critiquing the results from that. You could see 
that it lacks that originality, it lacks that human touch that is very necessary when we're talking about um, authentic communication, even as journalists or writers or researchers. So um, it's, very, it's very important to be mindful of the downside and I can go on and on. There is this new term now um, talking about anthro, anthropo, anthropomorphism, the tendency for people to ascribe this, this human-like qualities or characteristics to AI, especially with, 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 the, with the revolution that we see with chatbots like uh, ChatGPT. Um, and so we should really be careful. We should not over-rely on AI. Uh, because um, when we do so, it gives us it gives us a, a false sense of security in technology. Okay, um, it's interesting. So, Stephanie, how how have you or news houses, media organizations been using AI? And you know, what uh, what do you consider the greatest risk and fears as someone who is you know a member of the press or the media? Thank you, Anthony, and hi, everyone. I think Dr. Chukwizi, if I'm not mixing up the name, just said the ball rolling in the most perfect way. Um, to answer your question, I'd like to start by giving a little bit of background, right? And um, after the Second World War, the United States of America developed a plan, right, to rebuild, the, to rebuild Europe in general or Western Europe. And the plan was called Marshall Plan. Um, one of the major successes of the Marshall Plan is actually building up or coming up with um, a strategy called the economic growth paradigm. And communications played an important role in, in fact, one of the major roles um, in, on the Marshall Plan. You know, And then the major thing on the Marshall Plan was that they were going to infuse money. There was going to be an infusion of economy or rather money, large sum of money into modern technology. And um, I wouldn't say that was where it all started, but I'll say that also did impact or lead the way to where we are right now. And um, I'd like to make reference to the fact that 20 to 25 years ago, uh, journalists were not using all the digital tools. Maybe they were using some, in advanced countries, but no, the journalists did not use digital tools about 20 years ago. In fact, when some digital media started to operate in Nigeria, there was a huge backlash as to what they were, if they were actually journalists or they were bloggers, right? Because they did not see the future. But now the tables are turning. Most media or most, yes, most media organizations in Nigeria and across the world own uh, digital platforms because the world is changing. Well, the essence of this background is as time goes on, things will definitely change. Things are evolving. There is no media organization now that is not catching up with the trend. However, the question would be, uh, is the trend good or what are the implications of the trend? And then that brings us to your question. You know, um, yes, a lot of media organizations are trying to catch up with the trends, but are these trends impacting the freedom of expression? Are they impacting the freedom of the press? Absolutely. Because just like Dr. Chikese said, he said um, some of the, when, when using some of these uh, bots, you know, uh, bots that generate responses, you know, you know, one of the major impacts I'll say for journalists or people working in the media sector would be privacy as well, impact on privacy. Especially here in Nigeria, we all know how privacy is absolutely important for Nigerian journalists. I mean, you have to protect your source, just like Benedicta said during the, the first session, you know. So if you're unable to stay on top of your game, by being digitally smart, not just digitally smart, but having the knowledge on how to control your privacy, then that's a, that's a terrible thing entirely. But then um, again, for me personally, I am not of the opinion of using um, AI tools for, for official duties, especially for the kind of jobs that we do, right? Because to do the work as they should, who do not verify, who do not uh, 
you know, get enough data as they should. And then we're now talking about this bots who are doing the like all the jobs for us, right? So I would say that, yes, it has a huge implication on the job as journalists and also freedom of the press and freedom of expression. Okay, thank you very much, um, Stephanie. I can see um, she's actually um, nodding and nothing, but, you know, this is um, for Liz, Liz next. Chigizi mentioned when he was talking that, you know, AI machines, you know, AI cannot be original. Um, would there be a possibility of us having, you know, AI as a legal person, right? Um, someone who can sue and be sued right now. And do you think there's a possibility of us accommodating that if it doesn't exist now into, you know, the, the laws that we have existing? Uh, yes, thanks, Anthony. Um, so on the issue of a legal person so far, we don't have any policies that actually address uh, whether an AI can be considered a legal person. Um, and I think for the largest part, the argument has been that because a company or corporates also have this uh, legal status, why is it that an AI also cannot be granted this status? Um, and I think the challenge with this is mostly that um, whilst a company has people behind it that you can identify, uh, who, who is behind this AI? Is it the person who created the AI? Is it the people who code it? Is it the people, the person who bought that AI and actually owns it? So who is the actual entity that owns this AI uh, to which you can place those rights uh, and attach it as a legal person? So at the moment, it's not there, but I don't doubt that moving forward, perhaps um, based on, uh, on policies of different countries, it's something that will be possible. Yeah. Uh, okay, and, and Godson, when we when we look at the laws and how they have advanced over the years with new technologies, you know, coming, you know, over time, most times you don't have laws existing. Um, what are you? What do you anticipate the most when it comes to intellectual property, um, AI, and what it can do, especially when you know we're talking of you know, the media space, social media, um, press people, and, you know, people who work within that um, space called uh, the media. Okay, so um, I'd like to start from where um, Liz stopped. So she started from addressing the issue of whether or not um, AI can be classified as a good person. And I'll take us back to when companies started at the beginning, we all we all skeptical about oh, this is a company. How do we say um, a company is a legal person on its own? How do we ascribe rights to a company? And it was difficult then, but then the laws were created, and then now we understand. Then the court also sanctioned it and said, okay, now the companies are now regarded as legal persons. And that's the stage we are right now for AI. At this point, we are all confused. There is no legal framework. We can't say there's any legal framework. Everybody's confused. Nobody, nobody wants to answer the questions that we follow from when you decide to classify AI as a legal person. And that's just it. Then down to your question about what, what the laws would, um, what I envisage that will happen to the laws in the future. And um, at, at this point, what um, we can say about the relationship between the laws and AI. So I give a, a, a short example about the companies. And that's how I look at it. I believe at the point we just have to face our fears and understand that all oh, this thing has come to stay with us and we just have to find a way around it. So why AI at this point, AI technologies have some sort of protections under the law? AI generated activity also have some sort of protection under the law. Most people do not know that. One for AI technologies, Computer programs, softwares are copyrightable. So you can actually get copyright for um, your software programs, which power the AI technologies. And then you can also patent them. So something we call patents, that's an aspect of IP. So softwares are patentable. The computer programs are also patentable in some jurisdictions, not all jurisdictions. So these are already existing protections for AI 
um, technologies and AI generated activity. Now the question of who owns um, the copyrights in AI, that thing that's what Liz was trying to address. Now you go back and ask yourself, who turns on who operates these AI technologies? There's a very high probability that the person who operates these technologies or the person who turns on this AI technology should be regarded as the owner of an AI-generated activity. But this begs the question, where does AI get the data is used to give you the finished product from different sources? But then if you go bring it down to Nigerian law, for a work to be cooperative in Nigeria, all the two, two um, threshold as originality and fixation. And the threshold for originality has been brought down by virtue of, of, by virtue of our recent copyright laws. All you need is just some effort, some additional effort. So you see that AI generated activity, without doubt, are eligible for copyright protection because there's some level of effort in the work. But then, as I said, I advancing, previously, our, our previous copyright laws was very strict, wanted originality, fixation, and everything. But now you can see that the judge has been reduced to just some effort. And that tells you that now AI, that, 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 that tells that they've considered several digital advancements. They've considered the fact that AI has also come in. And that, that, that means several other laws will also do the same. So I see, I see what, what's going to happen very soon is that several policymakers will have to come together and start pushing for ways of advancing AI in, in the system and creating a regulatory framework for AI. But then I won't say that that is going to be very easy because then the issue of liability will have to come up at some point. Because at the, at the point you created a company, you know that, okay, the company is liable and sometimes you can leave the view of the company and hold the owners of the company liable for the activities of the company. But then who do you hold liable for the activities of an, an AI-generated activity? That's another question. Do you, do you hold the, the, the operator of the AI or the manufacturer of the AI responsible or liable for the activities of the AI? I think I'll stop you and let someone speak at this point. Many questions, many questions you've raised. Now, Lavina, I, I wanted to say, you know, um, what ground rules should we set and what rules? Then should we even incorporate, you know, AI into anything or something as delicate as uh, the press, media, because we control narratives, stories that last for generations? I absolutely love this question because, uh, you know, it's it's the curiosity point for everyone at this point in time. Um, so to part of your question, should we actually have rules and some frameworks for us to navigate into the space? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. I think like any other technology out there, at the moment, AI is seen as a tool and it's an extension of the things that we can currently do in terms of automation. Um, and that's the current ability of it, right? Uh, but as it progresses, we will definitely need to look into further instances of uh, frameworks. So for example, what happens when an AI has to sell off something on your behalf? What happens when AI has to auto create something on your behalf? What happens when AI becomes um, CEO of a company? What happens when you have you know, a whole lot of workforce that is reporting into an AI? Or what happens if you have one human and a whole stack of swarm robots? Um, you know, um, these are things that are the reality that is coming uh, and will face Africa relatively soon. So yes, absolutely, we do need that. Um, in terms of when and how, this has always been the tricky bit, right? Because there's, there's kind of two different rules of thumb. One is around, you know, let's just not regulate anything until it creates harm, right? Um, so it's more the reactive approach, which we've seen traditionally, whether we're talking about regulation laws, bills, um, you know, someone doing something incorrect, human behavior, whatever it is. Um, so it's almost like a post sort of synopsis of it. When we talk about it from a uh, you know, preventative measure, so that means what are the things that we can put into place from now till then, uh, you know, that becomes a whole different conversation. And there's a lot of things at our disposal that you know, can actually be uh, to our benefit at this point in time. So you know, 
uh, whether it is um, you know within your organization or within your entity, you start thinking about AI in terms of you know the what what is the actual implementation of AI within my organization? What is it that I actually wanted to achieve? What is it that I wanted to work within? So once you start identifying or pegging that particular area uh, that you wanted to function within, it becomes more of a controlled environment, right? Um, added to that, you can start doing things like a self audit. So, you know, get your algorithms and audit your algorithms, audit your data within your organization, you know, go for the full picture, um, you know, um, in terms of uh, your policies within your organization, go and update them, right? So that it is more friendly or more inclusive, uh, you know, in terms of accepting AI to be part of an extension of human uh, engagement, right? Um, so yeah, again, I think there's there's many fronts and many facets of how we could actually tackle it, um, but I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, um, Lavina. Um, thank you, Liz. Thank you, Godsin. Thank you, Chikizi. Um, I'm at my time now, and I just have about um, three to four minutes. Um, so for Stephanie, um, in less than a minute, what jobs, how do you see jobs changing um, as a press person, um, as someone in the media? Um, and um, for, again, let me just allow Stephanie, um, this is like wrapping up, um, one minute each for each person. Um, and I would just let Chike, Lavina, um, Lisa, and Godsin go after that. So, Stephanie. Hi, Anthony. Um, so, your question was, how do I see jobs changing? Is that the question? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Um, how do I see jobs changing? To be honest, it's a rhetorical question to an extent, especially working in the media. And welcome everyone back. Chikis here, Yudora, Onichi, Liz, Gotsin, Lilian, Mary, Miriam, and LSPR. Uh, so, Dr. Chikis here, um, just, you know, Taking it back from where um, Stephanie was talking about, you know, jobs and what jobs, you know, we foresee and what jobs will look like, right, when we actually have AI in play um, in the media space. What are your thoughts? Uh, the answer is, not, is neither here, or, you know, it's neither here nor there because, um, yeah, I know, I mean, this is a widespread worry or concern about how AI is going to. Uh, displace workers or jobs. But, but I think for me, the most important thing is um, we, should, we should be having a conversation about hybrid AI. You know, hybrid AI, combination of human effort and human intelligence and AI intelligence or artificial intelligence. Because um, of course we've seen over and over again that AI is, is um, is 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 infallible. Is not. It cannot be complete. You know, completely dependent on. It cannot completely replace or, or displace uh, human effort, right? Um, and so there is this sort of aug augmentation, um, augmentation and hybridity that needs to happen to be able to give um, room for human effort and human efficiency and artificial intelligence to work. And for that to work effectively, I think that there needs to be proper training uh, in different industries and different professions um, about you know, proper training of, of, uh, of workers, of professionals on how to use AI and how to use AI constructively, not to depend on AI wholly, but to use AI constructively, to use AI to make their work easier and more effective. So, um, I'm, I'm advocating for hybrid hybrid AI, augmentation of human intelligence and AI. Um, you know that that's what I see happening, rather than a complete um, a complete uh, extinction of human human effort or human level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the training of students or preparing students, because you work in a, in a university. When it comes to preparing students for the future, how prepared are we? Universities across the continent, because I know you've lectured in Nigeria, you're lecturing in South Africa now. How prepared are we, or how are we preparing students um, that 
manage that will manage narratives of the future um, to meet with the expectations of this new technology? I think we're not ready. That's the simple answer. We we are not ready. Um, I mean, I to think that Nigeria does not even have a national AI policy document. We don't have it yet, and it's just only I think five. African countries that have such you know, policy document in place out of the 54 African countries there are. Um, I was recently drafted, I was, I was recently appointed to be a member of the expert team, the national expert team that produced the, the draft of the national AI policy for Nigeria. And we just recently um, finished working on the draft and submitted it, to, I think it will go to the federal government sometime soon. But that's where we are. We don't even have, I mean, I, I think increasingly what we're seeing in African countries is the lack of political will to, uh, to take, you know, for government to take AI seriously and to, and to really figure out how to um, harness the power of AI or, or, or to even have policies uh, that will regulate. I hear somebody talking about um, how to legalize AI and stuff like that. These are, these are conversations that government should um, should 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 lead and also and then invite key stakeholders key stakeholders into the conversation and to help the government uh, build what the framework or the policy should look like so that we have we can then run from there. But well, I will say congratulations to Nigeria because Nigeria is now one of the very few African countries that are that are taking it seriously. I mean, like I said, the uh, the policy draft is in place and hopefully. The government that is coming very soon is going to um, still continue that conversation and make sure that that document is out. And then, but in terms of other things like uh, curriculum education, that's still a long way to go. I think that is much needed recurriculation of the teaching uh, content that we have in, in, in our schools in Nigeria. We're talking about not just universities, but also secondary schools, because that's where the that's where the teaching and the training should start from. And to think that we are in, in the digital age that uh, where digital technology is very is, has become normal and taken for granted. And but many people are not taught in schools how to use how to, how to use uh, digital technology. Uh, um, you know, maximally how to take advantage of digital opportunities and digital production. So. That Nigeria is still a long way to go, and there needs to be a policy, and then there, there needs to be recurriculation from the university level or secondary school level, and yeah, that's that, that, that's when I, that I, I will know that we are ready. And and this of course applies to many other African countries. Okay, thank you. And and this is for Liz and for. Um, as we um, wrap up and you know, final points, looking at the law and AI, which persons do you think need to come together um, to ensure that we get the framework that actually works for people in the media space and people um, within that space we call press, knowing that we have a lot of people now because of the democratization of information we have people that are social media influencers. We have bloggers and you know, all of this. Which stakeholders do you think you know, we need to bring to the table? And how do you think we should go about it to ensure that the law um, doesn't stay too far from you know, innovation? And this is wrapping up with you know, your final thoughts too. OK. Um, in terms of stakeholders, I think anyone, um, anyone in the creative space um, is ideal, um, particularly when you talk about the authorship aspect. So um, most countries, like Ben said, um, do not recognize AI um, as an author because uh, the laws uh, require an author to be a human being. So um, when you think of AI as it is used in um, the media, um, the potential issues to do with copyright. So which works will these AI works fall under? Um, does it mean that because there is no author, if that work is created by an AI, uh, a journalist can just take those pictures and publish them without any legal repercussions? 
or are we going to create policies that mean um, when you come across those works, then you have to openly license them? So perhaps those works fall under uh, Creative Commons licenses, which means nobody owns them, or you can use them um, without having to ask for permission. Or uh, can we assume that those works then become orphan works? So orphan works are works which you don't really know who the author is there. You've tried everything, but you cannot identify them. So which category will AI works for? And if they do not have an owner, and it's a good thing for the media because it means you don't have to worry about paying anyone for licensing for one, and you don't have to worry about um, infringing anybody's um, copyright works. So in terms of the stakeholders, everyone, everyone creative uh, should be involved in trying really to determine the best way um, to maximize the use of works created by AI for the benefit of, of, of society. And then we also have to uh, think about um, kind of data that is used to train. Most people think that you know, AI works are not original because they need to learn through other people's works, all right? But I think the notion of artificial intelligence is the machine has gone beyond that. So it's gone beyond what the data was fed into it and it is creating something entirely new. So when it creates something original um, that doesn't exist before, then what happens then? That is a new work. Um, how is that to be treated? So uh, with, with AI, I think um, it depends on the uh, IP offices of each country um, to sit down with the various stakeholders and really try to determine according to their society, what is the best way to treat these works? And I think um, that will be a good thing. Uh, but at the moment, there is no uh, tangible country that accepts um, AI uh, as an author in copyright law. Uh, okay, um, very interesting points raised, and I have a lot of questions or follow up questions. About Godson, what do you think? Um, just to lend my voice to what Lisa said. Um, it starts from both the inventor of the AI. We have to understand that it's not just um, the media that, that needs to be part of the stakeholder, it starts from both the person who creates the AI technology, because then the media personnel, then about the IP practitioners, intellectual property practitioners in different countries, because most people don't understand what AI is. You go to our government agencies, you don't even understand what AI is. So you have to first on, make them understand these things before you start talking about making laws about them. Else we'd have um, laws, and then we'd have issues with implementation of those laws, because we don't understand what those laws are about. So it has to be with everybody. Everybody has to be a part of this process. And then, um, for the media, they have to understand that um, one key issue or something they shouldn't forget is human intervention is always necessary in AI. At this point, that AI is at the developmental stages, we can't say that AI is perfect. We can't say, oh, we want to rely 100% on AI. So that human intervention is what keeps the sanity at this point in time. So both in every, not just the media sector, every sector, AI requires human intervention. Even at the point where AI has become perfect, it requires human intervention. And that's why I do not think people lose their job because of AI. Mm -hmm. AI. So, so that's my view piece on that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, Chike, for your closing remarks, um, I don't think Stephanie, um, I don't think I can see Stephanie. Um, but for your closing remarks, I would want um, us to talk about this information. Um, We've seen the social media, the internet, you know, has made misinformation rife. As we're introducing, you know, AI tools and all, what should we expect? Knowing also, because I, I think for a balance of stories, to be fair to AI technologies and these tools, there are also tools that are being used to combat misinformation. You can use AI tools to also do the same thing, right? Um, so it's like a you know, double-edged sword. What are your thoughts around how we should treat misinformation as we get into this new world of AI? And what would your final thoughts be around, you know, like advice to people in small and big media houses and those who are like individual um, persons who have access to spreading information? So I, I think it's like a two or three in one. <laughs> okay, um, by the way, Misinformation 
information through AI or AI power tools is, is now called, uh, is not, th there's a term that is circulating now called hallucination. It's what uh, tech, tech giant and tech people had coined to describe a situation in which um, an AI system provides an answer that is factually incorrect or irrelevant or nonsensical. Um, and, and for me and for many other scholars, the, the, the problem is that they are calling it hallucination, but I think the, the word should be called what it is. It is misinformation, it is, it is, it is nonsensical, you know, just call it, because if you don't call it what it is, then you are, um, you know, sort of not wanting to ascribe any sort of imperfections to AI. Um, there is this scholar called Naomi Klein. She was writing in The Guardian a few days ago, and she, she's arguing that tech companies um, and their tech evangelists are now the ones, uh, you know, pushing the narrative of hallucinations. AI hallucinations should be seen as normal and, and uh, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, that is that is a problem because the uh, over romanticization of AI is the real hallucination because we don't yet fully understand how AI will make the world a better place. I think, I mean, apart from it helping in workplace and stuff like that, there are growing concerns that there are gro growing concerns about the ethical and regulatory issues. Um, when you talk about the fact that all of these technologies that are coming out are also very profit oriented. People are building these technologies to maximize wealth and, and you know to make profit. And this leads me back to my earlier um, uh, highlight about technological solutionism and technological skepticism. I think we should be skeptical, technological skepticism, where we take a step back and you know have a conversation about ethical and moral and regulatory dimensions of AI. Uh, and then how do we do that? I think we need to continue to have this conversation. I suggest that we use AI with caution, even for journalists or people who use it daily in their, in their, in their, in their work. I've talked about augmentation of AI, hybrid AI. I've talked about uh, journalism relying on human journalism and not just, you know, um, on AI journalism, you know, which is which is the in thing now, where people just ask AI to write new stories or even try to copy to 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 to, to write a, a a journalistic report um, that mimics a particular well-known writer or author. So I think um, this is a conversation we need to keep having. But I, I I'm I'm talking about caution here. I'm talking about hybridity, augmentation, and um, yeah. As okay. skepticism. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Chikizi Uziwana. Thank you very much, Dr. Sinuboso. Thank you, Liz Oyange and Gando. Um, I don't think I said it Gando. <laughs> um, I already said Liz Oyange, and I think she corrected the last time. You know, this Liz Oyange and Gando. Thank you very much um, for your thoughts. We would keep having conversations like this. Um, most likely in collaboration with Mac and Artificial Intelligence Group, um, because it's really important that we have these discussions, these conversations, and set the tone um, for what policymakers and um, practitioners within this space, you know, can you know fall back to as you know where they would rely on for you know the kind of frameworks to set in place, right? Um, and we can also spur more conversations um, with our own conversation on awareness and what next to do. Um, if we have any thoughts randomly, anyone else, um, Chi, Chi, Neze, Amafo, Miriam, Yusuf, any thoughts, Manichi, um, Bime, if we have any thoughts, uh, this is time to share it uh, before um, we actually wrap up for today. No thoughts, just to say thank you to the panelists. It's been uh, a very informative, uh, session. Thank you all for sharing. Thank okay, you thank you very much. Yeah, um, someone else, Chick, Chick is here. You want to say something? No, I was saying thank you to, to everybody. Yeah, thank okay. you for the invite also. Yeah. yeah. So we'll keep having conversations like this across our platforms Twitter, LinkedIn, um, 
and on our website, uh, Africa Tech Radio, thanks to uh, um, Tech on Code, CJID, LSPR, um, and thanks to everyone who um, joined in. Um, you know, despite the many issues uh, that we've had today, not planned. Um, we actually thought we had everything covered, um, but this one just crept up, crept us on, um, on us. So thank you very much. We'll plan for another um, discussion like this and keep everyone in the loop and in the know things. So thank you. Um, see you again next time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.